Hello, this is Dr. Grande. Today's question is, can I analyze the case of Margaret Rudin? Just a reminder, I'm not diagnosing anybody in this video, only speculating about what could be happening in a situation like this. If you enjoy this video, please like it, subscribe to my channel, consider supporting me on Patreon, and check out my podcast on YouTube, Bella Grande Media. I will put the relevant links in the description for this video. So first I'll look at the background of this case, I'll move to the timeline of the crime, then offer my analysis. Margaret Rudin was born in Memphis, Tennessee on May 31, 1943. Her family moved several times. Margaret would live in 15 different states growing up. She graduated from high school. She married and divorced four times. Margaret would meet a man named Ronald Rudin in Las Vegas. He went by the name Ron. Ron had also been married and divorced four times. Ron's third wife brought an end to her own life using a firearm. Ron was investigated in connection with her death, but ultimately cleared. Margaret and Ron would marry on September 11, 1987. Ron was a successful business person. He owned a strip mall and a real estate company in Las Vegas. Ron and Margaret lived in a house located directly behind the strip mall. It doesn't appear as though they had a happy marriage. Margaret's sister, Donna Cantrell, would later say that Margaret would complain a lot about Ron being stingy. Margaret hoped that Ron would die from his health conditions. I'm guessing that Margaret's favorite part of the wedding ceremony was the line, to death do us part. In 1991, there was some type of argument between Margaret and people who worked for Ron. Ron would not let Margaret come into the real estate office prior to 5 p.m. She had to stay away from the employees. His employees claimed that Margaret had been listening in on their conversations using a phone line that was shared between Ron's house and the real estate office. Ron removed that phone line to prevent this from continuing. In an effort to reestablish the surveillance, Margaret and her sister placed hidden listing devices in the real estate office. Ron's attorney would say that Ron felt as though Margaret was becoming increasingly vicious and violent. Margaret was a 40% beneficiary of Ron's trust. He was worried that this was a motive for Margaret to kill him. Ron issued a secret directive to the trustees of his estate, ordering them to take extraordinary steps to investigate the cause of his death if he happened to die by violent means. The directive would also indicate that any beneficiary who caused his death would not receive anything from his estate. This seems pretty obvious, but I guess it's important to be detailed in those descriptions. Two years after this, in 1993, Ron increased Margaret's share to 60%. So she had 40% and she went to 60%. This seems unusual based on his prior concerns. In 1994, Margaret used the listing devices to discover Ron was having an affair with a former employee. As this was going on, Margaret also developed a close relationship with a man named Yehuda Sharon although Margaret and Sharon denied they were having an affair. Now moving to the timeline of the crime. On December 18, 1994, one of Ron's tenants at the strip mall noticed Ron walking toward Margaret's antique store, which was also in that same strip mall. The next day, December 19, which was a Monday, Ron didn't show up at the real estate office even though he usually opened that office on Monday mornings. One of the employees called Ron's house, there was no answer. Investigators started working on the case when two of Ron's employees reported his disappearance at a local police station on December 20. The investigators started piecing together the timeline. One of Margaret's friends claimed that she called the phone at the Rudin residence and spoke to Ron on December 18 at 8.10 p.m. Ron said that Margaret was not there. On that same day, December 18, Margaret claimed that she called Ron from her cell phone sometime between 8.30 and 9.30 p.m. There is no record of this call. She said that she worked late on that day. She was in her antique store until about 1.15 a.m. on December 19. A friend of hers testified that she was with Margaret in the antique store from about 9.15 p.m. on December 18 to 12.45 a.m. on December 19. At 2.20 a.m., on December 19, Margaret stopped by an accounting business, which was in the same strip mall. I guess they were working late. 
One of the owners of the business, Carol Cuazzo, said that she had never met Margaret before. Margaret introduced herself and spent at least 30 minutes making pleasant conversation with Carol and her husband. Margaret claimed that after she left that office, where Carol was, she returned to her residence and noticed that Ron and his vehicle were not there. She thought that Ron was upset because she had been working so much at the antique store, and he just decided to go out and spend some time by himself. On the evening of December 19, Yehuda Sharon, who again was Margaret's close friend, rented a large passenger van from a rental car agency in Las Vegas. Sharon told the rental car agency to remove the back passenger seat in the van. He said he rented the van because there was a shipment of holy oil that needed to be picked up in Santa Fe Springs, California. On December 23, Sharon returned the van. It had traveled 348 miles, according to the odometer. Sharon told investigators that on December 22, he drove to California, but he never reached Santa Fe Springs. He heard a truck driver mention that it was raining in California, so he turned around. On December 21, Margaret hired a day laborer named Augustine Lovato to clean up stains on the carpet located in front of her washer and dryer. Lovato would say that the stains appeared to be from a dark brown substance, and an effort had been made prior to his arrival to clean the stains. On December 22, investigators stopped by Margaret's antique store. She gave them permission to search her residence. They didn't find anything. Margaret's sister said that on that same day, she visited the house and noticed that Margaret was reading will and trust documents, which she had retrieved from the real estate office on December 19. On December 23, Ron's Cadillac was discovered behind a bar in Las Vegas. It was locked. The police would find two sets of keys for that vehicle inside the car. There was a lot of dirt on all four of the floorboards. This was not typical of Ron's behavior. He always kept that car in perfect condition. There were fingerprints in the vehicle, but they did not belong to Margaret or Ron. On or about December 29, Margaret's sister, Donna, was helping Margaret collect documents when she noticed a certificate from a firearm safety course that Margaret completed in 1993. There was also a handwritten note that read, It's you or him. Get him first. On January 12, 1995, Margaret once again hired Augustine Lovato, this time to help her convert the master bedroom of her home into an office. She instructed Lovato to cut out a 9 by 12 area of carpet from under the bed. Lovato said the carpet had dark reddish-brown stains and a strong odor. He said it smelled like his dogs after they had been chewing on rabbits. Lovato saw the same stains on a glamour shot of Margaret, which was hanging over the bed. Several days later, he noticed a reddish-brown blob bubbling out of the bathtub drain. Margaret told him to load the mattress and box spring from the master bedroom and other items into a truck and abandon them in an alley, which he did. There are so many red flags in the situation, I'm not sure how Lovato could walk around without tripping. Lovato did actually find these items suspicious and would eventually, of course, go to the police. Fishermen discovered charred human remains and a burnt steamer trunk near Nelson's Landing at Lake Mojave on December 21, 1995. There was only a skull and about 500 grams of bone but investigators were able to identify the remains as Ronald Rudin. This was due to dental records. They found three 22 caliber bullets inside his skull and four bullet holes. Two days later, investigators notified Margaret. She showed no emotion. The steamer trunk was similar to one Margaret purchased and was seen in her antique shop during its grand opening. On January 27, 1995, when Margaret was not at her house, the police searched it they found blood in the master bedroom. They would also find blood on that glamour shot referenced by Lovato and the box spring they found in an alley. Margaret was spotted driving toward her house as the search was underway. After seeing the police cars, she just kept driving. She stopped at a few places before going to Sharon's residence. A few hours later, Margaret and Sharon left the house and drove to California. Margaret boarded a flight to St. Louis, Missouri. About a year and a half later, on July 21, 1996, 
a scuba diver found a 22 caliber Ruger semi-automatic pistol at Lake Mead. It was fitted with a silencer. Investigators learned that the firearm was registered to Ron in 1980. He reported it missing in October of 1988. Furthermore, Ron had stated that he believed his wife had packed the pistol in her belongings as she was preparing for a divorce. Apparently, the couple had contemplated separation or divorce several times during their marriage. At one point, Ron filed for divorce, but later on withdrew that filing. According to Ron, there was one incident where Margaret fired a gun at him and missed. He took the gun from her and fired another shot into a headboard. So they had some pretty bad arguments. In April of 1997, Margaret was indicted on several charges, including murder. The police would not be able to locate her until November of 1999. She was in Massachusetts. She was placed under arrest. During Margaret's trial, her attorney, Michael Amador, tried an unusual strategy. It doesn't appear as though he was prepared to defend Margaret in this case. He started his opening argument by saying, This is a great day. Every day can be a celebration. This is a great day for me. This is a culmination of my career. I think he meant detonation of a career, but who knows. He went on to say that he had thrown away most of his prepared remarks. And there may be objections and things like that, don't worry about it. The judge was confused by this, along with everyone else in the courtroom. It's like the lawyer was just stalling for time. Everybody in the courtroom knew that Michael was not prepared for the trial. Another attorney was hired to help, but it was too late. The damage to Margaret's defense was already done. Surprisingly, the judge allowed the trial to proceed. On May 2, 2001, Margaret was found guilty of first-degree murder, a few months later, she was sentenced to life in prison with the possibility of parole after 20 years. In 2008, an appeal of her conviction was successful. The court determined her attorney engaged in egregious misconduct. In 2010, the Nevada Supreme Court reinstated her conviction. At the time making this video, Margaret Rudin is still appealing her case. On January 10, 2020, 76-year-old Margaret Rudin was released on parole. Now moving to my analysis. Was Margaret Rudin actually guilty of murder? Let's look at the factors both for and against the idea that she was guilty, starting with the inculpatory evidence. Margaret had a motive. Ron was having an affair, and she stood to gain financially from his death. She had a keen interest in financial documents after Ron's disappearance. She even hired a locksmith to get into his real estate office so she could obtain the documents. The trunk found near his remains matched the one that she owned and could not account for. Ron said that she had taken the Ruger 22 caliber pistol, and that pistol was used to murder him later. The handyman reported seeing blood in several places in Margaret's bedroom. He was ordered to dispose of items that had blood on them. The police found the blood in the bedroom and on those items. If somebody else killed Ron in his own house, how would Margaret not know that? Why wasn't she worried about the blood stains in the carpet on her picture and in those other places? Why pay to have evidence thrown away, and why not throw it away in a proper disposal area as opposed to an alley? Margaret had been on the run for 30 months before she was arrested. She lived in Mexico, Arizona, and ultimately in Massachusetts, where she was arrested. She had a number of disguises and fake identities. She had received advice from several people on how to survive on the run. Margaret claimed that Ron tried to confess to her that he murdered his third wife. In response, Margaret told him, you're not going to relieve your guilt by telling me, I don't want to know. She claimed they never spoke about it again. This seems convenient and very difficult to believe. One would think that someone's fifth wife would be quite interested in the idea that the husband had murdered his third wife. Moving to the exculpatory factors, if Margaret worked alone, how did she physically dismember and dispose of Ron's body? Prosecutors, of course, believed that Yehuda Sharon was a conspirator. They even gave him immunity to testify against Margaret, even though they did not know how he was going to testify. He was granted the immunity, and he testified, but he said he didn't know anything. He was never charged, and of course now he has immunity, so he will never be charged. 
What were the prosecutors thinking with this deal? It is important to know how somebody's going to testify before offering them immunity. During the trial, Margaret was offered five different plea deals. She maintained her innocence. She turned down every deal, even though she could have been let out of prison sooner. There were no witnesses to the crime, no video. Margaret never confessed, and no physical evidence tied her to the murder, like nothing was found on her person or in her vehicle or anything like that. There was this story about how Ron had ties to the mafia. Perhaps they killed him. I don't think the defense really put this narrative together, but some would consider this exculpatory. I guess one could argue the method of murder was a common mafia tactic, that is, shooting a victim in the back of the head several times with a 22 caliber. When considering the evidence, do I think that Margaret Rudin was guilty? Yes, I do. I think there was doubt in this case, but not reasonable doubt. The evidence I considered the most convincing was how she tried to dispose of bloody items, was connected to the murder weapon, was overly interested in finance documents, and stayed on the run for 30 months. Why didn't Margaret take one of the plea deals? If she knew she was guilty, why risk a life sentence? I wonder if this is part of the hatred that is consistent with murdering a spouse. She wasn't going to give Ron even one more concession. She was going to stick to this story of innocence. What about Margaret's awful attorney, Michael Amador? Michael had book and movie contracts regarding Margaret's case, a clear conflict of interest. He had taken Margaret's case pro bono, hoping it would significantly affect his career. He thought it was his big break. He was correct. He significantly broke his chances of continuing to work as a lawyer. Years later, in 2009, Michael Amador was arrested for assault with a deadly weapon and injury to property after an incident outside a bar. Allegedly, he was in the bar and walked out. He confronted a few men. He produced a lawfully concealed firearm and fired a shot through the back of a car window. It's not clear what happened with those charges. I don't know if he was convicted or not. On February 12, 2021, Michael Amador died at age 66. What lessons can we learn from this case? Looking at the history of Margaret and Ron, like before they were married, what really stands out is all those quick marriages. Both married quickly and divorced quickly. Margaret and Ron were married in a small chapel on Las Vegas Boulevard, where people get no more than 15 minutes for the whole wedding before they have to leave. Some of the features Margaret liked about Ron include that he was unpredictable, and she didn't know anything about him. He was mysterious. After marrying him, she would learn about his characteristics, including his mood swings, his excessive drinking, and his penchant for infidelity. Ron also learned a few things about Margaret after getting married. He would say that she had a dual personality. Sometimes she was lovely, but other times she was violent. So here's one potential lesson from this case. Two people will learn about each other to varying degrees both before and after they get married. Obtaining as much knowledge as possible before the marriage allows somebody to make an informed decision. This can help prevent a lot of unpleasant discoveries after the marriage. Those are my thoughts about the Margaret Rudin case. Please put any opinions and thoughts in the comment section. They always generate an interesting dialogue. As always, I hope you found my analysis of this topic to be informative. Thanks for watching.